we can sit around all day long and make up words like chalant and irregardless and zombie takeout if we feel like it, but I got a case to crack. What's up? Welcome to episode 305 of Zombie Takeout. Zombie Takeout. The Be Moving Cult Movie Podcast. I'm Uncle John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get rolling, um, there's just something from a couple of weeks ago that I need to talk about. I forgot to bring it up last week. Um, the line was, he's in accounts. <laughs> accounts. <laughs> now say it with the British accent. Yes, yes. I, I'm not going to try, but I see what you mean. He's in accounts. I've, I've rolled it back to find the line you were talking about. And I, I mean, I could understand it because I've got a pretty good ear after, you know, watching how, you know, having many British, British channels on YouTube. But we're, I could we're definitely. Speaking, hmm? we're speaking of the man in the white suit. Yes, yes. Two episodes. Ago. Right. There was a line that you didn't quite hear correctly um, that you saw, thought was something that was quite profane. Uh, it turns out it was He's in Accounts. Um, and and I, nice 1951 movie. <laughs> He's in a cunt. And and I mean, as much as I could understand it, I knew exactly what you were talking about as soon as I heard the line. Oh, you can't unhear it, man. You yeah, can't. Yeah. Uh-huh. And on to some listener submitted. This is from John Phillips in reference to last week's episode, our review of Star Trek Generations. He said, do you think Kirk's oh my was an early form of trolling? That was a Shatner pause on steroids. He He'd never given... An honest to goodness Shatner pause. Right, right. Until I mean, then. it become the cliche of the joke to imitate him as he, you know, how long, Spock? Just <laughs> yeah. How long? And said he did the, it was fun. Oh my. <laughs> and I had suggested that maybe oh my was um, George Takei's catchphrase well before, you know, he, he went public with it. Which is really strange. I mean, that was from, oh, I can't remember which 94? movie it was. Well, no, no, like, there, Takei said, oh, "Oh my, (laughs) like that. It was one of the earlier ones where, you know, they saw something, you know, just that, you know, Uh jaw-dropping, and so he gave it, oh, my. (laughs) I'm just thinking maybe it was a dig at uh, Takei. So I don't know. But it was definitely trolling the critics, I think, the haters. yeah, yeah. And Bodo Winter left us a voicemail in reference to last week's episode. Hey, Bodo Winter here. Great job, guys, as always. I'm just listening to the latest episode. Uh, I believe it was Malcolm McDowell, not Rodney McDowell. I'm sure you probably already gotten a thousand messages about that. Uh, As far as Star Trek goes, uh, I like most of the movies. I thought they failed, and I always wanted them to do something with Deep Space Nine or Voyager. Also, they didn't put Q in any of the movies that I remember. Also, the DuBras sisters or DuBras sisters, they always reminded me of those weird twins in Super Jail who always stood back and watched everything, caused trouble and mischief, but never really got their hands dirty, if you know what I mean. But anyway, great job, guys. Keep up the great work. Love the show. Bye. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, you know, I didn't catch it. You said, Ronnie, yeah, but thanks for the correction, uh, Bodo. Um, I, 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 I didn't go back and listen to it. I, I don't remember saying Roddy, but I, I t- probably did. Um, so I'll take your word for it. Um, I saw Tales of the Gold Monkey long before I'd ever heard of Malcolm McDowell and Roddy McDowell was in Tales of the Gold Monkey, if you don't remember. Um, and so I, I go to him first. I mean, Malcolm, of course. I mean, I've been a fan of Mozart in the Jungle, which he's mm-hmm. just killing it on. So oh, okay. I mean... Definitely need to watch that if Malcolm McDowell's on it. <laughs> I think the third season just came out. So that's what I'm doing uh-huh. during winter break. So, yeah, again, thanks for the correction. Um, we didn't get any messages. In fact, you're the only person who's caught it. <laughs> well, you know, people listen to these in stages. You know? mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Some people are just doing it out of order you know it's, it's 
we're not a chronological thing. Right, you know? right, right. I, I just corrected something from two weeks ago. Um, right, exactly. <laughs> so people are going to be like, what the fuck? <laughs> I maybe you want to go back to right, that. Right, right. I would love to see a DS9 movie. I would love to have, because oh, it's not going to happen now. I'm sure we've even mentioned that, that mm-hmm. a DS9 movie would be awesome. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I and mean... of course, the Q should have been in a movie. Yeah, but the, the, I think the Q and DS9 are all both stories that they told in the series, really. Yeah. I mean, like, Wrath of Khan was something they made up a, a second chapter right, you know, yeah. to bring back, mm-hmm. and, you know... The next generation, of course, had a continuation of a lot of the stories from mm-hmm. the series. But there's a lot of stuff. I mean, the DS9, it, it was done when it was done, really. Right, yeah, yeah. As great as a movie would be with those guys. But Q was such an iconic villain. He really oh, yeah. should have shown up in a movie. Definitely. And they could still bring him back, which, I mean, would be fantastic if they... Yeah. Oh, he, oh, in the reboot. Is, oh, yeah. Exactly. Since time and, and universe is irrelevant to him. Um, John Delancey has noticeably aged since then, so they'd have to recast. Oh, God, yeah. But he would have knowledge of both universes. Yeah. That could be really interesting. Who would play the new Q before we get to our, our universe? <laughs> oh, who would be the new Q? That's a good question. He doesn't necessarily have to look like Delancey because it's a new universe. Um, though he probably should. I go with Brett Spiner. He's again. He's in his sixties. Um, oh yeah, you're probably right. He's up there. Um, I had to check. I was curious to see how old he was when he did Star Trek. He was in his thirties when he did Next Gen. So. Oh, I'm gonna get some hate mail for this. <laughs> this idea popped into my head. Okay. Jim Parsons. That actually would work really well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. There we go. <laughs> In fact, he could just play the Sheldon character as Q. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. In fact, is he actually just playing Q now without the powers? Now that I think about it. <laughs> That's fuck? a good point. I don't know. It's been a while since I've seen um, Big Bang Theory. Yeah, yeah, I'll catch like a rerun on or some mm. every now and again. I haven't seen Super Gel. You you were saying neither of you. Um, sounds like something we need to review at some point. I know 2017 is shaping up to be interesting, a packed year. Because yeah, I mean, yeah. we've we've got so well, we've got many everything we pushed back. <laughs> I mean, that yeah, I've had like two suggestions over the last couple of weeks that uh-huh. were like, oh my god, I cannot wait for us to do these. Mm-hmm. And since it's our last episode of the year, on to of course our. Best and worst lists. Uh, this year we went with a top 10 and a bottom 5, because apparently we didn't torture ourselves enough this year. We really did not challenge ourselves at all this year. We, mm-hmm. we coasted. Yeah. But come on, we've been, we've been doing this for how many years? We mm-hmm. deserve kind of coast. Yeah, we deserved an easy year. And we picked yeah, the you know, right year, year to go easy on us. As it was, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> we picked the right year to go easy. But uh, next year we shall... The pain. Mm, yeah, uh, especially the first movie, but we'll get oh, to that. We're right off the bat, we are uh, going to yeah. bring the pain next year. We usually go with something big for the beginning, you know, a trilogy or, you know, two movies in one or something of that nature. Um, it's one movie, but it's, it's style. yeah, it's going to be worse than Showgirls. Um, yeah. Okay, starting with the worst of the year, my number five is Mascots. Um, it was a do- it was a two brainer. I didn't hate it, but it, it was a pretty thin on the ground for bad movies this year. Um, yeah. At number four, I have Ghost in the Shell because it's wildly overrated, and every anime fan is going to disagree with me on this. <laughs> it, it's a very unpopular opinion among anime fans. Oh, well, oh. It's it's kind of considered a classic. <laughs> yeah. At number three, I have the predictable ones: Cannibal Women and the Avocado Avocado Jungle of Death. And I would never have to say that title again. <laughs> <laughs> at number two, Godzilla 98, of course. And at number one, the worst movie of this year. Possibly the worst movie we've reviewed. I don't know. I, I don't want to compare it back to back with Showgirls. I know it's worse <laughs> than um, um, the Britney Spears movie, Batman and Robin. I had psychologically blocked that we did that movie this year. <laughs> yeah, you totally forgot about it. I was just like, oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> Oh. You, you you completely cut out there. Say again. Um, I had uh, 
I had uh, said, what were we going to do? And you said, uh, what are you talking about? We did Batman and Robin this mm-hmm. year. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. So, or, uh, do you want me to do my f- bottom five? Yeah, bottom five. Uh, we're very similar. Um, hmm. I've got uh, Cannibal Women as my, my number five. Oh, wow. Four, I've got Ghosts in the Shell. Mm-hmm. Three, I've got Under the Cherry Moon. Oh, okay. I had a feeling that would show up in your bottom list. All three of those are two brainers. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, under a normal year, they would not have made a bottom no, five, no. honestly, all three of those, because there are just so many Fowler movies out mm-hmm. there. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, Godzilla mm-hmm. and then uh, that, Emmer- Emmerich Edition is number two, and we, mm-hmm. with only, which only had one brain, mm-hmm. and Batman and Robin, yeah. which really could make an all-time worse list. Um, I'm almost fact, tempted to back to, to AB it with the showgirls just to see which one I hate more, but I've already vowed never want to watch showgirls again. Well, wasn't Catwoman right up there with it? It was bad, but I don't think it was a du- was a double zero. Hmm. Because it's not on the avoid list. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Finally, the best of the year list. This was the difficult one. Well, difficult in a different way because we really had to narrow it down. Yeah. At number 10, I have Godzilla 14, um, the Gareth Edwards version. Loved this one, loved uh, his previous film, Monsters, can't wait for Rogue One. He just really knows how to do big-scale action. At number 9, I have Fifth Element. Um, as you put it, it's an amusement park ride. Yeah. It's a lot of fun, it just has no depth. <laughs> At number 8, I have Gitchy. Um, directed by a friend of ours. That did, that's not why it's on the best list. I just really love the <laughs> perverseness of it. At number seven, I have Lemmy. Once again, rest in peace, Lemmy. Um, one of my heroes. Loved it. Just wish they had talked as much about the beginnings of Motorhead as they had um, Hawkwind and his previous band. <laughs> now we're into the really good stuff. At number six, I have Fido. Probably the best zombie movie I've ever seen. Could be. Number five, True Stories, beautifully weird in a way only David Byrne could do. Number four, I have Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And these four, you know, these top four are really kind of interchangeable for me. Um, at number three, Pootie Tang. I, I adore Pootie Tang. I really wasn't sure if I would like it as much watching it for the show, because it did been several years. I, I was worried yeah. it was going to be one of those movies. It's held up just as well as I remember. Um this was the only change I had to make. Um, if you remember, I put my list together back in September just to see, you know, right. if I could predict. The only change I had to make, I had to swap this one and True Stories. The Man in the White Suit at number two. I had it at number five before I rewatched it and remembered how amazing it is. <laughs> I had, had to bump it up to number two. And of course, the best movie of the year has to be Rhinoceros. Cool. All right. So we're, I think we're, we're pretty close to this. Here's, mm-hmm. here's my, uh, my second attempt at getting some hate mail. Actually, <laughs> it's not that I'm attempting to get hate mail. It's mm. just, you have unpopular just opinions. Call like I see him. Yes. Uh, number 10, Snowpiercer. Uh-huh. Uh, I've heard so many bad things about it, wow. but it's a pretty, <laughs> I mean, once we, we sat down and watched it, it was a pretty kick ass movie. I have some issues um, with the ending, but aside from that, it's great. Yeah. Uh, number nine, Frankenhooker, mm-hmm. or a little trip to Jersey. Interesting. I, mean, you, I included Gitchy, you included Frankenhooker. Right. Gitchy and Frankenhooker was part of that uh, two part episode. Uh, Lemmy, of course. Mm-hmm. I fucking loved the, yeah. all the stories about Hawkwind. And uh, I think I listened to Hawkwind and shit for like uh, a whole month after we did mm-hmm. that. Um, then uh, Star Trek Generations, uh, Fido, number five. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Man in the White Suit, number four. Number three, Rhinoceros, which, I mean, okay. if that's not a 2016 movie, I don't know what is. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, a movie... The, one and two are movies that have been quoted and near and dear to me for so many years, and I've referenced in this show, uh, number two, of course, being Galaxy Quest. Uh-huh. Um, the performances are fucking phenomenal. Yeah. Just saw Tony Shalhoub actually on uh, in off Broadway when oh, wow. I visited out there uh, in something called the in the band uh, when the band visited. Mm-hmm. I, I hope I'm getting that title right. 
but they're this uh, Egyptian band visiting Israel, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's hilarity ensued. But um, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, number one, he hardly needs any introduction. Mm-hmm. Uh, I should have said number three, number one. <laughs> Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I had which... a feeling your number one would be Grail or Rhinoceros. I forgot how much you love Galaxy Quest. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, I it almost felt like we were cheating by adding Akira back in there again because mm-hmm. we thought in the first place and decided to see if it yeah. held up, but it did. So mm-hmm. there it is. <laughs> All right. So finally, on to this week's movie, which is from 2003, The Hebrew Hammer. Of course, that brings us to the impromptu possibly. Sponsored by Frank Capper's It's a Wonderful Life. Now that's some cold shit. Uh, you, got the, you got the shit part right there. Uh, and also brought to you by Bagels. You really don't need to be Jewish to like them. No, no, not at all. Though it probably helps if you're from the tri-state area. Hey, we get some good ones out here in Chicago, too. <laughs> and of course, the Milwaukee area. But anyway, mm. um... To the plot summary here, we begin with um, oh, I can't I can't say some of the words they called him. In the <laughs> song. Yeah, I mean I physically can say them. Yeah, just it would be a bad idea. I just don't want to. Mm-hmm. Why do we need to do that? But uh, in context of the movie, it's pretty damn funny. Mm-hmm. Um, we we have um, well we have a, a Jewish boy. We begin. We begin. We begin origin story of course and uh just kind of the feeling of being the uh the lone person in the middle of a culture Mm -hmm. that's just kind of forced down your throat um and it's always something to you know we're thinking about because we we take so much for granted that you know the majority and all that yeah but uh, yeah, there's of course one lone Jewish kid in the uh, man. It looked like it was a, a Catholic school almost <laughs> that he was at. I mean, the first. It actually reminded of, me a bit of a Christmas story. Right, the first frame of the movie is the picture of Christ on mm-hmm. the cross. I think it did say it was a Catholic school. It was a Catholic public school. And so yeah, he's trying to uh, you know trying to fit in or get onto the radar, but I mean he's still holding up to his traditions, so he mm-hmm. does full Hasidic with the yarmulke and the curls and everything. Right, and even the teacher who tries to tries to help, kind of with good intentions, but mm-hmm. underlying uh, not so much. Yeah. Uh, still, of course, uh, keeps him isolated. And it was because uh, of that gag that I knew how to spell Hanukkah correctly in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always remember the comedian Dennis Wolfberg that, you know, when he was in Alabama, mm-hmm. you know, happy Shaka Khan. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, into the future or the present day where he has grown up and he is, of course, one bad motherfucker. Mm-hmm. So um, he's the he, certified circumcised dick who's a sex machine for all the checks. Yes, he is. He uh, <laughs> He is a private investigator. Uh, I guess uh, they, there's a backstory about him working with this Jewish Justice League where he uh, was sort of on the outs with them at the time in the beginning. But of course, uh, something happens being Santa Claus mm-hmm. is murdered and his uh, evil son is taking over and wants to wipe out Hanukkah. And so they have to call him back to do the job right. And um, he spends the rest of the movie trying to uh, hunt down Santa Claus and save Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, find a nice Jewish girl to settle down with. If you've seen any black exploitation movie, just change the stereotypes a little bit. Right. This is the first ever Jew exploitation Mm -hmm. movie. (laughs) You saw that video, too. What's that? The the there was a video from the writer director who that refer in which he referred to it that way. I, I you know I did not, but I mean, what okay. else can you do? Mm. How else can you call this? Yeah, I yeah. mean, it, it is taking the black exploitation formula and just throwing Jews in there, mm. and uh, hilarity ensues. This is basically the Jewish version of Black Dynamite. It is definitely. And, and, I mean, they hit every Shaft reference they possibly can. 
they did, and I mean, it, it loses a little bit in the in the in the brain department because you know Black Dynamite came first, and so many of those other black exploitation spoofs came along. Right. But it, that being said, it, it is just put a nice twist on it, yeah, to go off to make it something not black. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Loved Santa's death scene. And right. Santa's son. You didn't say who played Santa's son. I'm surprised. Well, yeah. The opening credits, they say who's playing. I didn't see him, him referred to as Damien Claus, mm-hmm. but they refer to him as Santa Claus in the opening credits. Uh-huh. And his name alone as Santa Claus just made me laugh out loud. Right, right. And that is, of course, get ready for this. Hold on to your hats, boys and girls. Andy Dick. Mm-hmm. Not as actual Santa Claus, but as the evil son of Santa Claus who murders yes. his father and takes over. Yes, Damien Claus. And is it not only running a sweatshop, which made me laugh because of a YouTube thing I've seen recently that also has Santa's workshop as a sweatshop. Um, he's also incredibly racist. Like, he fires the one black right. elf. Um, and his evil sidekick, of course, is, is Tiny Tim. I-, I love that. It's actual Tiny Tim. Or he's portraying <laughs> Tiny Tim. I don't know. Right. Just a, a grown-up, you know, older mm-hmm. Tiny Tim. Right, but he's got the Cockney accent and everything. <laughs> and I love how they're picking apart the accent in what it seems. Like, what kind of accent is that, anyway? Mm-hmm, yeah. This movie was a lot more Mel Brooks than I was expecting. Oh. Like, the accent time. gag, and they talk dirty to me gag. Um, the, the JDL building in the shape of a Star of David. <laughs> that was so Mel Brooks. It's pretty much the Pentagon, only it's a Star of yeah, David. Yeah. Jewish Defense League is the JDL. Um, yeah. No, Jewish Justice League in this. I'm sorry. I, I flipped to the actual thing. But yeah, there there is a heavy Mel Brooks influence. And of course, Mel Brooks did a lot of these jokes mm-hmm. uh, in, in some of his yeah. earlier work. Um, a couple of great gags when he's in his office, too. Um, you, you get the classic, you know, um, private detective monologue. And that then... is what I liked. It went from the Shaft parody, and then it went to... Uh, the Justice League, of mm-hmm. course, and then it goes to the black and white noir. Mm-hmm. And you get his monologue as, as a cliche. Um, the female lead walks in, starts talking to him about her case, and you still hear the monologue, and she says, what's that? She was a tape recorder that was playing his monologue <laughs> that he said was client notes. And he was talking about being flaccid when she pointed it out. <laughs> and then one of my favorite gags, another woman walks in, talks about her case, and he said something like, it. you want Mike Hammer? He's down the hall. Right. They referenced Mike Hammer. I'm surprised we didn't come up with the Mickey Spillane joke for the title. But anyway. I'm wondering about the demographic for this movie. Because there's a Mike Hammer reference. There's a Sammy Davis Jr. joke. That's true. And they beat me to my uh, my my MC Hammer <laughs> yeah. uh, joke. MC Hammer, <laughs> don't I, hurt him. Um, you have an MC I Hammer had... lookalike saying that. I had two MC Hammer jokes for the title, like written before I started the movie, of course. Hmm. And also the the title of his, um, I won't say sidekick, but his assist, the guy who helps him out, uh, Mary of M. People's character. Honestly, this has to be the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I liked him in, uh, I think it was Heartbreak Ridge. Hmm. I think that's the one I'm thinking of. I can't right? really I think of many things I've seen him in, to be honest. I know there have the been Ay- several, but... The Ayatollah of Rock and Roller uh-huh. <laughs> in the Heartbreak Rich. In this, he plays a character named Muhammad Ali Paula Abdul Rahim. <laughs> Just that name killed me. Yeah. And he is the classic black exploitation character. you know. And his whole crew, it's basically, that's the black, di- the, the black dynamite portion. Yeah, definitely. Of course, but they've got the white accountant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And there's a joke in this movie that earned it a half a brain alone. <laughs> it's the one we referenced for the intro. It is probably one of the best lines in the movie. They mentioned irregardless, and they said it's not a word. I, I fell in love with the movie on that line alone. I fucking hate fact, irregardless. The fact that that's Peter Coyote. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> that's He's back and forth with on this. Mm-hmm. And another thing that is notable about this movie is it stereotypes everyone. Yeah. Every single character is a stereotype. It hits African-Americans, Jewish people, Caucasians, disabled people very briefly. Um, yes. 
little people. Um, they don't really stereotype gay people, but there are two gay characters. Yeah, yeah, they they were spared, I think. Yeah. One of my uh, favorite references that's just in the background that you probably only can hear if you're wearing headphones like I am when I'm watching mo- mm-hmm. movies for this. The sweatshop makes a they make a short round reference. Yeah, I caught that. Um, <laughs> Catch it. Okay, good. He brings in a bunch of Asian kids. I don't remember exactly where they were from. Uh, was it Taiwan? It was it Taiwan? Okay. And uh, one of them says something about Dr. Jones. Call me Dr. Jones for <laughs> Yeah, I did enjoy that. Another joke I, I absolutely loved, possibly because I loved the show when it was on. Um, they turned Power Puff Girls into Power Muff Girls. <laughs> there's this there's this line to see Santa and and there's this little girl with the, the Mona T shirt. And obviously they couldn't say Power Puff because legal. Um, of course. So they changed it to Power Muff Girls. <laughs> that killed me. It changes everything. Bit of trivia in reference to to the dialogue and and some of the jokes. Um, Adam Goldberg said, who plays uh, Hebrew Hammer, claims that he knew he had to do the movie as soon as he read the line Shabbat Shalom, motherfuckers. And that's such a great scene. He actually walks into a Nazi bar and gets a drink. <laughs> Try to order men's at a Nazi bar. <laughs> a Nazi bar, the black label, of course. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I actually looked that up. I don't think that's a real thing. I mean, Manischewitz is, but I don't think there's a black label. I, I, yeah, I seriously doubt there's a higher end Manischewitz. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's one joke that I, I don't think quite worked for me. Um, at the end, when the elves are kind of you know trying to you know stop the Hebrew hammer. And they've got these jackets on that are, I guess they're supposed to say um, SWAT on the back, but it says S-Q-A-T. I think they were going for squat, but that actually just spells scat. (laughs) Yeah, I wasn't quite sure what that was about. You need the U, otherwise it's scat. (laughs) (laughs) Now, of course, what, what took me out of it for a bit was the use of Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On. And it led me to this whole, like, when did this become a cliche? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, when did this become like the, ah, you know, it's just shorthand and it's kind of lazy. And the answer, at least according to IMDb, was 1999. Okay. (laughs) Like, before that, it was only used, like, a few times. Mm -hmm. I think Into the Night was the first movie I saw on the soundtrack. And, but... In 99, it was used in five different movies. Oh, God. Yeah, that's when it official, officially became short, uh, shorthand. And then after that, there was like, for only, for 2000, the only time was Jack Black's iconic high fidelity mm-hmm. scene. And then since then, it's been used in a movie a year, if not more than one. Huh. That's not even, of course, counting commercials. Now, we've talked about how, you know, it offends everybody. It, it tries to parody everybody. Um, during filming, the movie came to a, the attention of the Anti-Defamation League, the actual JJL, yeah. which were concerned that it might promote unfru- unfavorable images of Jews. The film happens to include a direct parody of the ADL as members of the fictional Jewish Justice League. After viewing the film, Warren Katz of the ADL brought a brought legal action against the producers of the film, but lost in a summary ruling handed down, handed down by the U.S. District Court in the Northern District of New York. The film also drew criticism from some Christians who argued that the film portrayed most Christians as being anti-Semitic and intolerant. So it, it hits both sides. Well, right. And that's, that's why it gets to do what it gets to do. Mm-hmm, exactly. There, there's a lot of people that could have sued... <laughs> If they were yeah. offended by this, uh-huh. get in line. I was waiting for Adam West to sue because that climbing up the uh, workshop wall gag was straight out of Batman. Right. If you do that parody, you really need to have somebody sticking their head out of the window like they did in that show. Mm-hmm. It it just doesn't work unless you do that. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, the man in the white suit, who knew? He really did it. Yeah, he actually climbed down the thing. <laughs> Loved the um, guilt is the most powerful weapon thing. Um, <laughs> kind of gave it away, but it was obvious. I didn't predict it, but as soon as he pulled it out, obvious it was, you know, I should have known. Yeah. Loved the uh, true meaning of Hanukkah gag. Nobody knew. <laughs> right. 
kind of saw the new Santa coming. It, that oh, was predictable. Yeah. You, that that was you could see that coming from a mile away. Mm-hmm. All right, so on to sequels and remakes. Um, writer director Jonathan Kesselman wants to make the Hebrew Hammer versus Hitler. Of course. In fact, he tried to crowdfund it a few years ago. Um, he made about fifty grand. I I don't know if anything has come of it since then. I hope it gets made eventually. Well, yeah, this sounds seems like it was made like a few years before it came out. Right, right. Like I I I'm seeing release date of '04, but I think it was filmed in '02. Mm-hmm. And uh, and honestly, I don't even remember seeing this advertised no, no. for theatrical release. I've only heard about it in recent years. In fact, I think you found it on Netflix and suggested it for the show. And it that was, was the first time I found I'd heard of it. It was on Comedy Central. Oh, OK. Uh, like a really like edited, heavily edited version of it, obviously, it was on mm. Comedy Central. That's how you and knew about it. OK, then you suggested it. And that was the first time I'd heard about it. I had almost thought it was just a made for TV movie. Mm-hmm. That they just it didn't make any sense because it was so heavily censored. It was kind of like that's weird. Why would they? But uh, no, it, it was actually limited release because I'm sure there were a lot of theaters that were very nervous about mm-hmm. uh, playing something like this. So of course, I would love to see that. I'd also love to see Lance Carruthers come out of retirement, or or not retirement, retirement, but for the character, and and do a Pootie Tang Hebrew Hammer crossover. Oh, oh, that's a good one. That would be amazing. How is Andy Dick still alive? <laughs> that's a good question. How is Keith Richards still alive? I would question Andy Dick. Well, Keith Richards just has his blood changed. Keith Richards. Yeah. Because <laughs> Keith Richards can handle it. Yeah, yeah, true. Andy Dick, not so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Under brains. Under brains. Like I said, the the irregardless gag bought it a half a brain. I'm going four and a half. Uh, you know, this is tough. I mean, it's not like incredibly original or groundbreaking, but it's enjoyable. It's uh, it's a fun ride. So I'm mm-hmm. going four. All right. And what have we learned? It's not even a high holiday. <laughs> I actually forgot this. I need to think of something. Um. <laughs> You know, if they do the uh, the remake, though, or not a remake, the sequel, the person, of course, I want to see play Hitler, and this is from uh, an episode of Drunk History, of course, mm-hmm. Weird Al Yankovic. Oh, yeah, definitely. Who really should have had some sort of role in this movie some way or another. Mm-hmm. And I learned that they're the only ones who are allowed to say those words. Oh, yeah, that is pretty much it, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That's the moral of the story, huh? All right, so until next year. Until next year, when we'll be reviewing <sighs> Fifty Shades of Grey. It's all up from there. Yeah, I think I think we already know what our worst of the year is going to be. Yeah, you know, the bar is set yeah. so low. You know, last year, or last year, this year, pretty much began that way too with Godzilla. Yeah, true. It was the second one of the year. Or did we start with the Emmerich? No, we, we started, started with the Emmerich. The, with the tribute. Well, we started with the tribute trilogy, but then, yeah, as soon as we got to the Emmerich because Godzilla, so yeah. died. Right. And, you know, I think 15, we felt the same way, yeah. too, of course. We were like, what the hell? Didn't let me actually pass in... 15? In late 2015, yeah, on yeah. the 28th of December, I think it was. Yeah. And, and I almost forgot, since this is our last show of the year, I just wanted to say... Fuck you, 2016. Good fucking riddance. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm I'm done saying fucking off to years because 15 was such a rough ride too. Uh, 14 and 15 were bad for me personally. 16 <laughs> was bad for the world at large. That is true. You know, that's that's a different that level. True. You know, I wasn't yeah. tempted to to tell 50, 14 or 15 to fuck off just because they were bad for me personally. <laughs> All right, so until then, of course, go to zombietakeout.com, check out the album or the episode description, of course, the episode itself, which you're already listening to. Links to find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and YouTube. Links to subscribe via RSS and iTunes. Please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. Also, if you enjoy the show, spread the word. Give us a little word of mouth. Of course, we appreciate all of the listeners we have, but more would be better. 
you also find the movie list, every movie we've reviewed so far, and every movie we're going to review up through 312 Johnny Mnemonic. I just looked at it. Wow. And the request form, if you've got a movie you'd like to hear us review, please leave it on the request form. And the recommendations list. Um, as soon as I saw Andy Dick in the trailer, I knew you were putting this on the rec list. You know, I did not know. I did not know until... Well, I, I didn't know until I saw the trailer. Yeah, I was pretty close. Hmm. Even after watching it, I was close. I wasn't sure what I was going to do because his movies don't tend to appeal to me as much as they do you. But this one had had so much Mel, Bro- Mel Brooks in the DNA that I just loved it. And was it, uh, but was he in Dude Burst My Car? Oh yeah, that was an exception. Um, but that was a cameo. Cage.com. Yeah, that was a cameo. That was an Andy Dick movie. That's true. You can email us, zombietakeout at gmail.com, or leave us a voicemail at 414-368-ZTO1, or for the alphanumerically challenged. You can go vet yourself. 414-368-986. When you haven't caught me off guard with that, one of them in a while, nice job. <laughs> it went all the sugar. Of course, always remember that you will always be calling from the middle of Milwaukee. And until next time, always remember never forget wherever you go in life. There you, there you are. are. Happy Merry holidays. Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy New Year. Happy Kwanzaa. <laughs> See you next time. Can you dig that shit? Digging it. You dig it? I dig it. Writer, director, this... oh, I forgot to put his name down. Um, do you have it? Ke- is it uh, Kesselman? Uh, remember the first name? Jonathan Kesselman. Writer, director, Jonathan Kesselman.